By popular demand, this video is all about ISAs. So we'll talk about cash ISAs, stocks and shares ISAs, LISAs, which is a lifetime ISA, innovative finance ISAs, which we don't use, but I'll explain why later in this video, and junior ISAs and why they are a fantastic idea for young people. So in this video, I'm going to tell you what we do as a family. It is not financial advice. It is not necessarily what you should do, but you can take some information from what I say, and obviously you can decide what you wish to do. So first of all, what are ISAs and why are they important? Now, this video is going to be deliberately straightforward from start to finish, and we'll go into much greater depth on different types of ISAs in later videos. So the main principle of an ISA is to allow you a tax-free saving or investment. So if you have money that you want to save somewhere with tax benefits, you can put it in a cash ISA. If you have money that you want to invest tax efficiently, you can put it into a stocks and shares ISA. Now, of course, you could always separately invest money in stocks and shares elsewhere, but you don't get the same tax benefits as you do with an ISA, but there are limits to what you can put into an ISA and certain limits as to how they work. So broadly speaking, if you have some money that you want to save and you want to have that, let's say, available as an emergency fund, but you want it to gain some tax-free interest earnings, the most beneficial is likely to be a cash ISA. It's the most straightforward. There are usually no penalties for you to take the money out, and they encourage you to save a fixed amount of money per month to put into the cash ISA so that it's gaining you some interest-free money along the way. But regardless of which type of ISA account you open and which you use, there is a limit per person of £20,000 per year, which for most couples, £40,000 between you per year contributed to the combination of ISA accounts is usually sufficient. But it's important to understand that once you've taken money out of one of those accounts, you can't just put it back in again. So let's say you've put in £10,000 out of your £20,000 limit so far. If you take out £5,000 and then put back in £5,000, you will now be up at £15,000 out of your £20,000 limit, because that's the way it works. Once you've taken the money out, any money that you put back in is still eating away at that £20,000 allowance. So ideally, once it's in, you should leave it in. And that is certainly the case for juniors, which I'll come back to a little bit later. The exception to this rule that comes with a caveat is if you find a flexible ISA. That is one where you can take the money out and put it back in again within the same tax year without affecting your overall allowance of £20,000 within that tax year. But you do need to check that it is a true flexible ISA account and that there are no other rules or restrictions on taking the money out. As the saying used to go, the ISA should be the first place you put money into and the last place you take it out from because, of course, you lose that benefit. An example here is that your allowance starting off at £20,000, if you put in £10,000, as we did in the previous example, you then take out, let's say, the same £5,000 and put the same £5,000 back in again, you still have £10,000 left of your allowance because it's a flexible ISA, meaning taking the £5,000 out did not affect your overall allowance. So you can put that back in again and then still have £10,000 left to go up to your full allowance. And so just to be clear, that £20,000 limit is across all of the types of ISA accounts that you might hold and that you might open and contribute to. So let's say you have a cash ISA and a stocks and shares ISA. Between them, you you can only contribute £20,000 in that one year. And of course, anything to do with tax and investments and contributions, we're talking about the tax year, which runs from the 6th of April to the 5th of April for 2023 to 24 and so on. So starting with what we do as a family, because we've got a combination of ISA accounts and a combination of other investments, which I'll talk about in other videos. But as for our ISA accounts, we have two cash ISA accounts. One of them is fixed, one of them is not. The one that is fixed pays out once a year because it's fixed, but it is a better rate than the other one which pays out monthly, which is not a fixed cash ISA. And while we have put money into those cash ISA accounts, we are not currently contributing to those. We are contributing money elsewhere. Again, for reasons I'll explain either later in this video or in another video. But we do have emergency funds in those cash ISA accounts, 
And if you were to do that as well, you will have those cash emergency funds available. But whilst you don't need to use it, it is obviously gaining a little bit of tax free interest and earnings along the way. Moving on to stocks and shares ISAs. Now, there are two very different types of accounts here. First of all, you can have managed accounts if you, with respect, have no idea what you're doing and you want someone else to pick the stocks and the shares that it invests in. Or you can pick those stocks yourself, which is sometimes referred to as a self-select ISA, where you will choose which funds or individual shares that your account is investing in. And again, it'll be tax efficient because you'll pay no income or capital gains tax on those investments. However, do bear in mind that if you have a managed account, there are going to be fees associated with that account. I'm not going to quote percentages because they are all over the place and it's a bit of a minefield. However, always look at the fees that you're going to be charged on those accounts because even what might look like a small percentage to take all the stress and the hassle away for you to manage the account yourself, those percentages do add up. And in a year that is not such a great year, even small percentages that eat away at what might not be a great return for that year, you may be better off picking funds yourself and not paying those fees. But of course, that then is down to you and whether you think that you can pick stocks that will suit your personality and replace doing the work that a fund manager would do on your behalf. If you think the fee is worth it, then by all means, you would pay that fee and have the account managed for you. But if, like us, you feel that you can research it better and pick your own and get the rate of return that you want, then perhaps this video is the first step along the way to learning enough so that you can do that yourself and avoid paying those fees. We currently use self-select stocks and shares investment ISAs i.e. we pick the stocks, but we contribute a set amount every month. It's one of these set and forget things. We consider this as a non-retirement investment, and once a year we will review whether we need to change or swap out the funds that we're investing in. Now we did spend quite a long time picking those funds, so we won't change them easily. Maybe I'll do another video on exactly how we picked those funds, because there's a range of different funds that we use. And we spent the time to pick them to ensure that they match our particular needs and mindset. If ever or whenever you sit down with a financial or investment advisor, they will put you through some kind of questionnaire, which will essentially determine what your investment state of mind is. Are you much more risk averse or or are you much more of a risk taker? That's not to say that you are gambling, that just might mean that you have some spare money and you would rather it go into high risk investments, which in the event that they do generate a return, there'll be a higher rate of return because it matches the amount of risk. So if you went into a managed account, you are much more likely to be put through one of these questionnaires. So they will determine what type of investor you would like to be and they would manage the account and they would pick the stocks and the shares and the funds for you. As for our accounts, we wanted to ensure that we have a diverse portfolio so that there are some very secure stocks and funds and some that are of more higher risk. As I said, I'll discuss those in a different video. As for junior ISAs, we use a stocks and shares junior ISA for the boy and we contribute a fixed amount every month. And again, it is a set and forget scenario. We put money into it every month and it will grow every month. The important thing to note here is that he cannot take it out until he becomes 18. So hopefully it is just one of those that builds up to the point where your child goes to university and it can pay for the university fees or whatever else it might be, buying the first house or whatever when they become 18. 18, they will have access to those funds and either convert it to a standard ISA or they can then use that money for whatever purchase or payments they need to make at that point. Now the junior ISA that we opened we actually transferred from the child trust fund which no longer exists. This fund was managed by a professional fund manager so it did grow somewhat but we felt that we could manage it better if we picked our own funds. So we converted the child trust fund into to a junior ISA and so far the return rate on that is about 18% which does vary depending on when we check it. But importantly as this is a long-term strategy and investment plan for the boy we don't really care too much about the rate of return more that it is a long steady consistent regular investment so that over a long period of time it is going to grow and become that fund that will give him the start at whatever it is that he needs to use it for whether it be university a house or whatever i wouldn't recommend that it goes on a car 
but more about that in another video. And so with each of these things, my thoughts on any of these ISA accounts, whether it's emergency funds or whether you're investing, the real key to building wealth is that it's got to be slow and steady. Yes, there are some scenarios where lots of money is made overnight, but we generally think that if money is made very quickly, it's lost very quickly. And real wealth takes a long time to build, and the longer it takes to build, the longer you're going to keep it, and generally the more it's going to grow. There is a limit on how much you can invest in a junior ISA, which is £9,000 per year. Now, speaking about innovative finance ISAs, we don't use those mainly because of the risk involved. With an innovative finance ISA, essentially you become a lender, providing loans to approved individuals or businesses with one of these online peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms in return for fixed amounts of interest over a period of time and paying no tax on that interest that you earn. But this is pretty much as it sounds. With no middleman, you essentially become the bank. So there is really a direct lender-borrower relationship between you and whoever is borrowing the money, which does mean that there's a huge opportunity for you to make some money doing this, but there is also significantly greater risk. Remember earlier when I mentioned that you'll do a questionnaire when you go for a financial advice session to gauge your views towards and your appetite for risk when making these investments. If you are perfectly okay with higher risk investments, but you want the opportunity to make higher gains in the short term, but personally, it's not something that we would look at. As I said, we prefer longer term strategic investment over a long period of time. And finally, we have the lifetime ISA whose primary goal is to help you to save up to buy, let's say, your first home or to save up for retirement. Now, there are lots of rules about lifetime ISAs. Uh, first of all, you must be between the ages of 18 and 40 to start a lifetime ISA. There's a maximum that you can put into one of these, which is £4,000, although it can be a combination of cash and or investments. You can contribute to a lifetime ISA until you are 50 years old. And if you intend to buy a house, you must be the first time buyer. Uh, so that you've never owned any property in the UK before is what that really means. The home that you intend to purchase must be £450,000 or less. Once you start a lifetime ISA, you need to keep it open for at least 12 months before you can use it towards the deposit on a first house or to buy the first house. When buying that property, you must use a conveyancer or a solicitor to act for you because many people don't realize that ordinarily when buying a property, you don't have to use a conveyancer or a solicitor. You can do it yourself, although many others will insist that you do so, but that's topic for another video. When buying the house, the house must also be bought with a mortgage and the funds in the lifetime ISA can only be withdrawn once you turn 60 or in certain other situations, for example, you become terminally ill. And if you withdraw funds before then, or for any other reason, you'll be charged 25% on the amount that you withdraw. So many people might conclude that this is not the best option for you. And now some more general principles about having accounts open, transferring accounts, and that sort of thing. Now, as you remember, there is a limit to how much you can contribute to each of these accounts per year, being £20,000 per individual or £9,000 for a junior. That's not to say that you can't have multiple accounts open at the same time. It just means that you can't contribute more than those limits per year. But you also cannot contribute to more than one stocks and shares ISA in the same tax year. You can only contribute to one of them. Now, whilst Technically, it might be physically possible for you to do this. Of course, that would be against the rules. And if HMRC were to look at it, you might end up paying penalties for contributing more than your allowance and earning more tax-free income than you are allowed to earn in that tax year. As for junior ISAs, it's important to recognize that it is owned by the child and no one else. So it is not your account, it will be the child's account, and only they can access the money when they turn 18, when it becomes an adult ISA, as opposed to a junior ISA. That gives them the opportunity then to continue building their financial future in a tax-efficient way, or they can withdraw and use the funds for whatever they need to. As for transfers, you can transfer funds from one ISA account to another, 
If it's a junior cash or a junior stocks and shares ISA, you must transfer the full balance between them. As for adults, you can transfer your ISA balance from one provider to another provider at any time. You can transfer savings from one type of ISA to a different type of ISA. The main restriction really is that if you want to transfer money that you've invested in the current tax year, you must transfer all of it. But in previous years investments, you can transfer part of it or all of it. So you could keep those accounts open and transfer some of it, or you could transfer all of it to the new provider. The one caveat with all of this with the lifetime ISA, remember the one with all of the rules, if you transfer a lifetime ISA to a different type Type of ISA before you reach that age of 60 where you can use the money, you have to pay the withdrawal fee of 25%. 25%. That's pretty high. The other potential restriction is with the higher risk, i.e. the innovative finance ISA. You may not be able to transfer those investments elsewhere and there may be some restrictions on your new provider and there may also be fees attached. There are also procedures and deadlines and timeframes with which you'll need to comply. So if you do want to move between these ISAs, you'll need to speak to both the new and the existing provider as to what fees or restrictions and timeframes that are involved. But typically they should take no longer than 15 working days between cash ISAs and 30 calendar days for any other type of ISA account. So if all of that sounds interesting to you, how do you go about getting one? Well, there's a number of different places you can get them from. In another video, perhaps I will tell you exactly who we have these accounts with. I'm going to speak to those companies first of all to see whether they can offer you any beneficial rates and things like that. So I'll do that in another video. But before then, if you are eager, you can get them from your banks, building societies, credit unions, friendly societies, even stockbrokers or various peer-to-peer -peer lending services, which is the one that we don't use. There are even crowdfunding companies and many other financial institutions that can provide these accounts for you. But overall, I hope that was a useful overview, very brief overview as to what ISAs can offer, what they can provide. They are by no means the best investment strategy for building wealth, but they are certainly a tax efficient one and is certainly as good a place to start as any. And you can use this in addition to others, particularly when you're in the position that you've maxed out your contributions to these ISAs i.e. £20,000 per year per person or £9,000 for the junior ISA and you want to look into other investments elsewhere which is what we do so I will go into that in another video as well so if you want a combination of both of these you can have them running at the same time all of which is to help you to build wealth on this channel so I hope you enjoy these videos please do pop the like button if you found it in any way useful if there are any corrections I'm happy to come back and do those because there's a lot of information in these videos um, uh, so don't worry about pointing those out. I will come back and do further videos to clarify any points that you have any questions for. But in the meantime, I'd really appreciate you bopping that subscribe button and I will see you in the next one.